Good morning. Um, so, let me see if I can make a little bit of room here. Put my computer up. Thanks. Okay, so, um, a little background on myself. I um, started at uh, the Stanford OTL in 1988, and um, probably could not have imagined at that point that I would be standing in front of a, a group as uh, august as yourselves to talk about this issue of what universities sh should, should do with their patents. Um, and, I, and I think my background, too, is kind of interesting and, and um, is a good sort of reference for, uh, frame for this discussion. Uh, the founder of the OTL, a guy named Niels Reimers, um, hired me. Uh, he founded the office uh, based on the idea of um, uh, you know, doing what's best for technology and to support the research and education mission of, of, of the university. The people that he hired to do the tech transfer uh, job uh, were all um, uh, technical people who had some kind of relevant business experience. And uh, interesting, I shouldn't be saying this in a, in a uh, particularly a Harvard Law School, but we had a policy that we weren't going to hire any lawyers uh, into uh, into into our job because we felt that, or at least Nils felt that, um, uh, you really needed people who who um, understand firstly understood technology, but secondly um, knew what the uh, difficulties of commercializing a pro uh, a product would be and how difficult it is to run run a business. And you know, having such an office would lead to a more effective uh, technology transfer. So that is, as that is a, as a backdrop, a little bit about, the, uh, about my history and, and where I came from and, and why uh, I joined the university. I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the issues. And, and what, I, when I, what I chose to do when I um, uh, was asked to be uh, on this particular panel um, framing the issues was just basically just to do a bit of a shotgun uh, approach about things that, that came to my mind about what are important uh, issues to be thinking about uh, for the purpose of, of, the, of this question. Um, and quite frankly, I, I really don't know what the answer is, uh, but I hope that uh, a, a lot of the uh, uh, comments or issues that I, that I raise here will provide some kind of uh, useful uh, point for, for our discussion. All right, so clearly the, first, the purpose of a, of a university is research and education. We've talked about that a little bit today. Um, and I, th I don't think there's any question um, uh, in anybody's minds that the, the, the purpose of a university is, should be, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, research and education. Um, but I question um, the idea that uh, uh, universities should be also um, uh, responsible or expected to create successful companies. And um, you know, having done this job for long enough, and, and now having gone into the, the uh, private world myself, you know, I know how difficult it is to 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 start a company and to to get a product at the door and to make salaries and all these these sorts of things. But you know, can we really expect universities to be good at both research and education and being good at um, uh, creating successful companies? A couple of examples that uh, I thought I would throw out. Um, where patents really didn't matter, or, and, and I don't think they're mattering today so much. Um, Oxford University has been around for over, over 900 years and ostensibly hasn't had to rely on its patents to excel at what it's done, what it, what it, what it does, or has done, to stay um, uh, excellent for all those years. Uh, you know, neither has Stanford. Stanford's only been around for 125 years, um, but quite frankly, we, uh, the university has not to, uh, had to rely on its patents to excel at research and education. Um, Frederick Terman, former provost of Stanford, uh, recognized father of, of Silicon Valley, uh, came up with this idea of steeples of excellence, and the idea was to build a community of technical scholars. Um, so, and rather than focusing on um, patents, Terman chose to uh, build the Stanford Research Park, and the idea being to bring industry uh, closer to Stanford Research and um, uh, researchers and, 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 and students. So on to my second point, um, the uh, university knowledge is effectively transferred through, through academic publications and in the brains of, of graduates. I don't know if there's a way to really uh, quantify this. This is something that we um, have talked about uh, when, when we um, are out talking in the, in the public. Um, 
one, but there is a bit of an anecdote here that I can tell you about. Gordon Moore, who was the, um, one of the co-founders of Intel, felt that the benefit of being close to Stanford was the ability to hire masters uh, and PhD students that were graduating uh, every, every year. And it wasn't so that Stanford could, uh, rather Intel could license more patents from Stanford. Third point, uh, patents have arguably less value today than when Stanford's office was created in, uh, in 1970. The Cohen Boyer patent, uh, issued in less than two years, in 1980, had only 14 claims and was licensed to over 400 companies. Con uh, contrary, um, in today's world, uh, in the AIA has narrowed patent to both subject matter, making it more difficult to get to get broad claims, the kind of claims that, that were in the Cohen Bohr patent, and the type of uh, inventions that, uh, uh, that universities excel at making. Furthermore, under the AIA, the inter-parties uh, review, reviews have uh, in invalidated patents at a rate at 82% for fu uh, fully instituted uh, petitions and 52% for uh, partially instituted uh, pe uh, petitions. Uh, and lastly, the, the first uh, inventor to file system forces universities to file patent applications sooner, uh, frequently on inventions that are potentially not fully enabled. So we're living in a much diff uh, more different world than uh, when, when universities uh, really fully started getting involved in uh, this idea of, of, of patenting and transfer technologies. Um, and then, my, then the fourth bullet point, uh, more, un, most universities spend uh, more money on patent management uh, than they make. That's already been discussed today, so I'm not going to, um, uh, to dwell on that further. Um, most, and then now I'll talk specifically about Stanford. Stanford most Stanford patents have not made any, money, uh, made any money. And again, I mean, it correlates to some of the st statistics uh, that have been, been shown um, already. Um, Another data point for, uh, on, on this point about uh, universities not making money is it took Stanford 14 years to, to break even. From, from 19, uh, 1970 to 1984, the university basically operated um, uh, in, in the red. Uh, so, so it took 14 years to, uh, to break even, and uh, we were in the black uh, until, in the, until this year. And now, for the first time since, since I've been in the office, uh, the university is going to be operating the technology transfer office uh, in the red. Um, and again, you saw the, this, the earlier uh, Brookings study uh, uh, statistic about 87% of university licensing offices not breaking even um, over a 20-year 20 20 period. So again, more, more um, uh, data as to you know, whether or not universities can um, stay effective or not. In, in tech transfer. Uh, so my last bullet point here is Stan on the first page is Stanford and MIT alumni have produced staggering uh, economic uh, value for society without accounting for university um, uh, patented products. So there was a paper by a professor at Stanford, uh, uh, Charles Easley, that was based on a 2011 survey that found that uh, 39,900 existing companies traced their roots to uh, the founding roots to, to Stanford alumni. Those companies today, in existence today, have annual revenues of $2.7 trillion. A related study at MIT found um, similar MIT-originated companies have annual revenues of about $2 trillion. So I look at that statistic and I think, hmm, maybe this is what universities actually do really well. Um, and uh, it's not to say, I'm trying to answer the, this question, so what, what universities should do with these patents, but I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that um, there's a lot of other data there, I think, that we can look at uh, to, um, to, to bring into this, into, into this uh, question. Okay, so a Stanford faculty member and successful entrepreneur said that startups do not uh, need an exclusive license. Uh, that Stanford faculty member happens to be our past president, John Hennessy, uh, who is a founder of uh, MIPS Computer and is on the board of, of Google. Now, I just want to uh, qualify that uh, 
John Hennessy clearly is, is a computer science uh, scientist, and this is, doesn't necessarily apply towards the, the, the life sciences world, which I don't think personally it does. But it is interesting that coming from a faculty member's position, uh, and the, the president at that, that, um, that he felt that, that uh, startups do not need exclusive licenses. Also, I'd like to throw out this idea, again, that's been around for, I think, as long as I've been around, is that non-exclusive licensing is a tax. I think most economists um, lower the idea of, of licensing from the standpoint, non-exclusive licensing uh, being taxed. It increases the cost of products. Um, but on the other hand, like we saw in the case of Corn Boyer, which raised $250 million over its, uh, its life, you know, it does go a long way to paying the uh, operating costs of the university TTOs and then helps to uh, keep the, the wheels turning so that we could look for um, that next big technology. Um, not a lot has been said about startups, but again, these are numbers I'm sure you all, all know that uh, high-tech startups usually take um, three to seven years from, from launch of a product, from launch to, to get to a license or to get any product, get, get cash uh, out the door. Uh, and then biotechs typically take uh, seven to 15 years. And, and the point here is that, that most are going to fail. Um, core patents are the kind of patents that universities tend to license um, are ten, generally are fundamental inventions. And uh, usually when a company licenses these early stage technologies, um, uh, they quite often um, decide that they can't commercialize that invention effectively. It's too expensive or just doesn't work somehow and they end up pivoting. Um, but what's really, uh, I think, important is the fact that they actually um, have created this, this team of entrepreneurs that get together and can try to figure out a, um, a relevant business model that will be successful. So when it comes to publicly funded research, universities as publicly minded uh, institutions strive to do what's best for the technology. That's, that's one common mantra is we do what's best for the technology. Um, but the question that comes to mind is, is doing what's best for the technology the best way to do technolo technology transfer? So Stanford has received more money from alumni don donations than it has made through, um, through licensing. Um, excuse me. In the 46 uh, years of its existence, uh, OTL has uh, received $1.7 billion in license royalties. Over a recent five-year period, Stanford has recently brought in $6.2 billion in philanthropic funding. Uh, so um, let's make sure I'm looking at the same slides here, because right, I did change them a little bit. Uh, again, you know, the point is that uh, universities have uh, other ways of, of making, making money, and philanthropic gifts uh, generally has been successful uh, for at least for, Stan for Stanford. And that's it for my, my comments. Thank you.